Institute of Agriculture here at the University of Western Australia. Before we actually get into what we're talking about, I'd just like to um, acknowledge that we are on Noongar land, um, and the Noongar people do remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of this land. So tonight's discussion is a fairly topical one to kick off this seminar series. It's something that a lot of producers have been speaking about, and it's also something that's trending in our mainstream media. And that's around how animal welfare is actually shaping practices in our livestock production systems. Now the inspiration behind tonight's seminar series was actually stimulated from some events that happened in January 2024, at which point we saw a live export sheep carrying sheep headed from Australia to the Middle East, stopped in its tracks and turned back to Australian ports, which meant these animals spent a few extra weeks at sea. Now this sparked a national debate around animal welfare, Australia's international trade, and generally just highlighted that we've got a massive gap of knowledge and public transparency around Australia's production systems. So tonight, as a bit of a start to actually addressing that transparency and knowledge gap, I've got a series of speakers who actually do know quite a lot about this. Uh, we're going to walk you through a series of short presentations followed by a panel event so that we can talk all things live export, animal welfare, and potentially where we're headed in the future in this field. Associate Professor Elizabeth Jackson. Liz currently holds a position at Curtin University. She's worked across the UK, has a particular interest in agri-food supply chains, and is a passionate advocate for Australian producers. So welcome, Liz. We are so happy to have you here. Well, thank you very much indeed for the warm welcome, um, Kelsey, and thank you for the opportunity to come and present um, to this expansive audience this afternoon. Um, before I get going, I'd just like to um, acknowledge um, some very special people in the audience who I'm so pleased to see. So Mr John Hicks um, is a, a, well, he's a retired farmer from Pingua, but he's one of the two people um, in this world who got me into agriculture. Um, because of him, I'm standing here today talking to you. So he holds a very special place in my heart. Um, it's lovely to see you here, Mr Hicks. And of course, um, Dr Rob Wilson, um, who I work with on a couple of um, uh, projects in the pig industry, um, which, are, which I'm enjoying so very, very much. Um, and also thanks to Farm Weekly, um, uh, Brooke and um, Troy Stockton from um, everyone's favourite ag radio show um, for coming along today. So yeah, the journalists are in the room, so um, everyone be nice and polite. Um, so I'd like to start off um, this afternoon. Um, this is other than showing my beautiful complexion for a woman of advancing years. Um, this is me um, on a live export vessel um, taken or in about September last year, I think it was, I took the opportunity through the Livestock Collective to go and see for myself um, about um, the, the conditions on board these vessels. Um, so I have um, photographic evidence um, that I wanted to share with you today. I've, I've been out there, I've seen it myself, and um, it was extremely interesting. So if you do get the opportunity um, to go on one of the, li um, the Livestock Collective um, Livestock um, vessel tours, highly recommended. So I'm going to be talking um, about, uh, rather than just animal welfare, and the, specifically the, the perspective of, um, of live export, um, of sheep exclusively, so not cattle, um, but a couple of, um, um, a couple of facts to, 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 to open the session today um, under David Vanderberg's uh, RAM. Um, this work, this um, industry is worth about $82 million a year to the Australian economy. Um, so it's not massive, but it's pretty big. Um, it employs about 8,000 people um, in the country, 80% of which um, are based in Western Australia. Um, you can see from the chart that I've got here from um, an agricultural market consultancy, um, episode three, um, where sheep come from, where, where sheep come from to service the Middle East market. And there are two quite prominent um, suppliers. So um, Australia, so this is of course between 2021 back to 2016, and you can see Australia is 
quite a prominent supplier um, of sheep to the Middle East. Um, but you can see the, the trend, the trend of quantity is trending downwards for Australia. But where it's trending upwards is Romania. Lots of sheep going to, um, going to the Middle East um, from the Romanian market. For us, notable markets to keep an eye on. Um, of course, the big news that's been out in the last oh, five to six months is the Saudi Arabian market has, uh, has um, reopened um, for, for sheep. I believe um, Jordan um, orders are up around 400%. So they're, they're, they're small, but they're, the, the increase is huge. Um, and Kuwait is another um, very interesting market for, for us Australians to watch. So I, got quite, I quite often get asked the question, why, why, why is this happening in Western Australia? Um, I've heard mixed reasons for why it started, um, and I won't go into that, but um, I'm going to start with this photograph. My, my style of presentation is always very photographic, based on photos, and really the number one reason is the autumn feed gap. So the autumn feed gap is that time of year around about now when there is feed for livestock, their welfare isn't being compromised, um, but the, the, the amount of feed available for them um, is diminishing while we wait for the winter rains. And that's what's called the autumn feed gap, and the live export industry has been fantastic in just sliding in to take those extra sheep at this time of year, taking them to the Middle East, to help with our competition in the market. So at, at, without live export, without the market for live export, really our sheep meat, so not wool, but sheep meat, um, goes, to, goes to local processors. So when we have an alternative market in this state um, for sheep meat, which is live export, there's more buoyancy in the market, there's more activity with prices, and so it's, it's much better for farmers and it's a much more active um, liquid market. I also quite often get asked, why don't you just crop the area? You know, who cares? Who cares if live export goes? Just crop it. The thing is with livestock, particularly sheep and cattle, they're grown in areas that you can't crop. Much of, this, much of the land in, in Western Australia is what we call non-arable, so there's too, too many rocks. Too many, um, too, too much, you know, native, na too many native trees, which of course you're not allowed to knock down anymore. Um, so you need to, so, so farmers are able to generate an income from these non-arable, non-arable areas with livestock. The last, the last photograph on my slide um, is really is, is, has become particularly important over the last couple of years. I get asked the question, well. If you've got so many sheep in this state, why don't you just send them over east when there's, when there's lots of abattoirs, where there's lots of, there's lots of activity in the eastern states market? Don't worry about it here. The problem is freight prices. With the price of diesel, with the price of labour, <laughs> with our roads not holding together um, because of um, um, weather, bad weather conditions, um, it's becoming increasingly, um, increasingly difficult and increasingly expensive to send livestock across um, to the eastern states. So that's really not, a, it, it's not a sustainable option, particularly when you're looking at animal welfare over long distances and also um, a carbon footprint. It's much better to keep the, um, keep the sheep in Western Australia and, and keep the sheep indeed. So um, in the last, um, the 2019 uh, federal election, there was a promise made by the Labor government that they were going to phase out live export for animal welfare reasons um, within five years. Back in February last year, it was announced by the federal government, right, we're going to put our money, um, money where our mouth is, other way around, um, and we're going to start this phase out of, um, of live export. And we're going to do this by planning how the state is going to survive without live export, how farmers will keep going with their, with their farming systems that have adapted very well to this live export market. Um, so the federal government put a panel of four um, industry experts together 
um, to solve this problem? How are we going to manage this? What, the, what can the government do to help with this phase out of the live export industry? And there are a number of responses to this. So there were some people I know who just wanted to drop everything and protest. This is not going to happen. It's going to be business as usual. There were other people who said, just kick the can down the road. Say nothing and it'll just never happen. Don't worry about it. Uh, if we don't say anything, no one will really remember it, particularly when we had issues, political issues like the voice referendum happening at the same time. Oh, they'll, that's more important. They'll deal with that and then forget about us and then we'll be fine. Um, but then there was another mechanism um, that the Department of Agriculture, Fo Fisheries and Forestry came up with for the general public to submit their, um, or anybody, to submit their opinions um, through this website. Now this closed quite some time ago, um, but the panel received over 4,000 submissions in all different types of, um, in all, all different types of submissions. Um, so the, the, the last panel event was in June last year. Submissions closed in to this in May 2023. Um, and then the panel released their report to Parliament, which has since been embargoed, despite a lot of press trying to get use freedom of information and lots of other organisations trying to use freedom of information privileges to try to access this report. Um, that was submitted on the 25th of, um, 25th of October last year. Tomorrow that will be six months. On Anzac Day, that will be six months ago. Now, this lack of information has had a very, very, very serious consequence on the supply chain. Now, a lot of people think that supply chains are just moving stuff or perhaps value adding stuff from, from, one, from one sector to another sector. Manufacturing, moving stuff in trucks and trains and boats, but it's so, more, so, so much more complex than that. Supply chains and supply chain management are about forecasting, understanding what your customers want, planning, resource allocation for what your customers want in order to get the right product to the right place, to the, in the right quantity at the right time. There is an enormous amount of planning that goes, in, that goes into this. And in the absence of that ability to plan, in this six months where we've had no information we have faced great uncertainty. And I've got here from um, the Live Court website a, a diagram of this live export supply chain. It's not complete, by the way, and I'll let you know why it's not complete. But you can see here the supply chain starts at the producer. The blue parts, I understand, are where Australians own the livestock, and then the red parts are where um, our overseas customers, where, where ownership is transferred from the, from, to the um, overseas customers. And you can see there's a lot of transport, quarantine facilities, government regulation, um, more transport, processing, um, consumer. But in the absence of information, this is what has happened. The absence of information about how we can, we can manage in the absence of li the live export. So farmers, what do I do about what about what do I do about joining my sheep for next year? Or the year after or the year after? Feed producers and millers. What what do I plant? What do I what do I manufacture? How much hay? How much pellets? If we need an alternative market, where are, they going, where, are these, where are these sheep going to go? Because it's getting difficult to send them over east. And, and developing more um, processing capacity in the state is extremely risky because we don't know if the industry is going to grow or not. And no one wants to manage that, to, to, to take on that risk at the moment. So we've also got ports. Don't know if you've been following the situation with the Fremantle ports at the moment, but um, there's been a multi-billion dollar project, Westport, trying to, trying to work, out, work out what on earth to do with the Fremantle port and whether we should move it or not, simply because, because of a social licence issue and a capacity issue. Nobody wants to live near ports anymore, particularly ports that smell like sheep and cattle. So, that, so what do we do? What, then these, are, these are big investment decisions. Um, the boats. 
what are we going to do? Are we going to get more sheep? Are we going to get more cattle? Are we, is this industry going to shut down? What do we do in terms of uh, maintenance? What do we do in terms of business growth? What do we do? These are big, 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 uh, big vessels. They need maintenance. They need upgrading. And without certainty, without knowing what's going to happen, um, it's very difficult for them to, to plan what to do. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the market, procurement and substitute, and su su procurement and substitute markets, you know, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they're wanting more and more sheep from us. And if they don't get them, where are they going to get them from? They want to give us their business, but they don't know whether we're going to be in the market for long enough to sustain the relationships that they need. Also in the processing sector, overseas, if you buy our sheep and, um, sh sheep and cattle, you handle them and you slaughter them on our rules. And this is what's called the SCAS, and uh, the, uh, the Livestock Collective I know is going to talk about this more, but our livestock, our rules. Aren't you? <laughs> oh, anyway. <laughs> I'll put up a website in a minute. Um, our livestock, our rules. That, of course, in, it requires investment. It requires a lot of investment, it requires a lot of training. Do we do this or not? And it's this uncertainty. And I think this is the only thing that everyone, pro-live live export and anti-live export, can agree upon at the moment. There is too much uncertainty. Um, animal activists want it banned now. People who want live ex uh, who are pro live export want it to continue. But currently we're in limbo and this supply chain is suffering terribly. So this is my final slide um, before I sit down and hand over to Dom. Um, so will it make another question that I get asked quite often is, well, Australia actually is not a significant player. In a lot of agricultural products, Australia globally is not a really significant player. So we, if we exit the market, will it make a difference? Um, this chart here shows this is sheep and cattle, by the way. Um, you can see we're about halfway down the list in terms of, um, well, dollars, that is, um, of, li of, of live export. And sheep are only about just over 6% 6, 6 of that value. Now, my question, my, what, the, what I want to leave you with is this idea that Australian values about animal welfare have considerably shaped the, live, the, the, the international handling of, um, of, of animals and what people know about handling and treating livestock through the introduction of SCAS. The SCAS system has fundamentally changed the way animals are handled throughout the world. They are our rules, but what we've seen is that our, and a lot of our customers resented having to, our, our values imposed upon them, but those who have changed have seen improvements in, in meat hygiene, improvements in the quality of meat that, 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 is, that is processed in their abattoirs. But we've also, we've also started to export not only our product but our knowledge as well. And Live Corp and Meat and Livestock Australia are collaborating on educating, on, on using our knowledge our world-class knowledge of animal welfare and, and handling practices to educate our customers. And the case that I've got up there is in Vietnam, where our, where our people are going to Vietnam because Vietnam has contracted us to share our knowledge because they know the benefits of improved animal handling um, in, in the supply chain, the meat supply chain. So that concludes my presentation, Kelsey. Have I gone over time? Excellent. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy to answer questions, but I now need to hand over. Thank you very much.
you may know him as the crazy Frenchman, depends how close you are. Um, but regardless of the title, Dominique is recognized globally as an expert in animal welfare. He's got over 20 years of experience in this field and is going to talk a bit about how animal welfare is inherently important to our animal production system. So welcome, Dominique. Thanks, girls. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start with a word of, I mean, some warning. First, my talk, do not have any pictures, including my own picture. <laughs> so that's good news for you. <laughs> uh, I couldn't find a way to put your picture, Kelsey. <laughs> okay, so Kelsey asked me to talk about animal welfare and life uh, and animal production. And what I've decided to do, it's actually give you a little bit of warning about animal welfare. This is not from me, it's from uh, David Meller, who is, I guess, more famous than me in the, <laughs> in the circle of animal welfare. He's a New Zealander, work a lot on animal welfare, and in 2016 he said, look, animal welfare is science is about 30 years old, and we still do not have a definition a unified definition of animal welfare. So the message here is we don't know really what we are talking about. But it doesn't matter. We talked about it. That's important. Okay? And basically we are at university, so that's what we do. Uh, anyway, that was written in 16, almost 10 years after, is still true. Okay? But what I'm going to do is looking through the evolution of the animal welfare framework, so our thinking, the concept of animal welfare, and showing that this has driven the way we assess animal welfare, but more importantly, that have been actually changing the industry and the livestock industry. That will be short at the end because I think I want to keep that for the discussion. So, the first framework, and it's not the first time we were talking about animal welfare because the discussion about animal welfare started roughly at the beginning of the 19th century okay, in, in the UK. But still, in the UK, they got the five freedoms. And anyone who talks about animal welfare will know what the five freedoms are. But there might be someone who doesn't, so I'm going to go through it. The five freedoms are nutrition, environmental, health, behavior, and mental freedom. And they basically said that if uh, the animal have some nutritional freedom, they should have ready access to fresh water and diet to maintain health and vigor. And the second one uh, is appropriate environment and uh, shelter. The health freedom is preventing disease. And the last two are sufficient space. And the last one, which is mental, and this is really from the original text, ensuring condition with avoid mental suffering. And if you have read all of that with me, you see that what those freedoms are about is avoiding something that is not good to the animal and pushing basically what the animal is experiencing towards something that will be okay. So then someone said that's good, but you know scientists will always discuss and argue about things. So they come and said, actually, you know, it's not that five freedom. They all work together, okay? And it's true that if you look at it, and if you think of an example, then being malnourished will create anxiety and might actually change your behavior as an animal. You might lo look for food, and if you are actually energy deficient, you have a lot of chance to be more sick, so freedom of health, okay? So they are all mixed together. And that's basically how the five freedoms were seen. But someone said, ah, that's maybe not enough. And someone said, we come with a three conceptual framework in animal welfare. And basically, you see that the first one, biological function, is what we were talking about in the, the first four freedoms. Okay. Affective step was the, fi the, fi the, fi the fifth freedom. I'm going to get there. And the last one, that they add upon was natural living. And natural living, the way it was defined by Lund in 2006, was animals find some undertaking uh, behavior very rewarding. So if we st 
start to talk about reward, we start to go over the limit of the neutrality. Suddenly, we had something that is positive, something that the animal is looking forward to do. Okay. Then, they got this nice uh, semi-Olympic circle. We missed two. Uh, and they said, you see, it's the same. They are, not in, they are not individually working. They are actually working all together. And the best case scenario will be number one, where everything goes together. So to give you an example, for example, uh, in biological function, you can think of in uh, zone three of a pig giving birth. That's biological function that we use quite a lot in livestock production. But if you go in six, that's maybe a pig giving birth outdoor, where there might be some predators. But if you go to one, it's a pig that gave birth outdoor in an enclosure where we control predation. Okay. So that was quite interesting. It's not the best use because natural living is creating some problem. Okay. But I will not go there today. And then, again, David Miller and Nayo Bosare came up in 15 saying, let's think a little bit better about this five freedom and call them five domain. And it was not rebranding, it was re rethinking of the whole things. And you can see that the first functional domain are exactly the same as the four freedom, and the fifth is also there. But it's the way they actually integrate things that was interesting. And this is from the paper, and I know it's way too small for you to read. But anyway, there's too much word, as Graham said, so don't try to read. <laughs> but what you see here is some if the pointer work, no, you can't, I don't have a pointer. Yeah, there's some red here and some green here and some red here and some green here. And basically what they've done is a balance between something that is positive versus something that is negative. Negative in red, positive in green, which, you know, like a traffic light. And what they did is they actually put together that if nutrition is restricted, then there will be a mental state of the animal that will be negative. So suddenly what is happening is the fan domain goes from negative to neutral to positive. Okay? So let's go back to those different frameworks. And they have some commonalities into them. First, the force category. I told you that a few times. Okay? Those four, four, five freedom and so on. Okay? The four freedom that are functional freedom, basically. One thing that they are in common that I didn't actually elaborate much on tonight is that the response of the animal to a challenge is need to be appropriate for them to have a good welfare, okay? That mental state or experiential state are central to animal welfare. Remember my flower, the one in the middle? That's true, and it's the big bottom part of the five domain, okay? The four categories or the four function, function of freedom or domain and mental state are all interconnected. And that's true in all the framework. But quite importantly is animal welfare is a continuum. And the continuum has been expanding over the last 40 years, okay? Remember that the first legal text about animal welfare were not called animal welfare law, they were called animal cruelty law. So we were already there. Now, any single state here got animal welfare legislation, which is a whole spectrum. And the fact, the mental state are in most, almost most of the text in Australia. But that's drive actually how we also assess, because we can use those five commonalities, if you want, of those framework to try to find indicators. And when I was giving a talk 20 years ago about animal welfare, I was saying, ah, you know, production might not be the best indicator of welfare. But now with the change in the industry, production can be a very good indicator. Then we use the behavior and we use physiology. And I don't have the time to go through all of these indicators because, I mean, 
there's book written on them, and there's a lot of them. What we know for certain about those indicators is we have very good indicator of negative state of welfare, pain, stress. I mean, the literature on stress is bigger than Benio. Okay, there is papers, and there's still paper coming on stress. Okay. Pain as well. What we do not know very well is how to measure the emotional or the mental state of animal. And because I like challenge, and I try to have an appropriate response to challenge, because it's good for my welfare, uh, we try uh, with a few people in the, in the audience to actually see if we could actually measure something in the animal to go and have an indicator that could be used from a negative to a positive. And we went and said, OK, how, how do we know that animals have a positive experience or a negative experience? We don't necessarily know for sure. We have guess. And what we did is we said, OK, there is one species where we can actually know. Are you happy? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's half of the species, <laughs> a representative of half of the species. That's human. So we actually took uh, some uh, neurobiological disorder markers, like anxiety, like depression, or um, compound that we actually get into the uh, psychological processes that we know in the brain of, of human, and they're all there, and you don't, need to, you don't need to read all of that, there's too many, uh, and we look at them. And so far, I must say, very humbly, we haven't been very successful because it's a continuum and there's a lot of things that change. And we haven't interrogated the organ that we should interrogate, this gray one, which is the brain of a sheep that I pinched from you, Graham. <laughs> not, not the brain, the slide. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and, and we need to interrogate that because what we can measure in the periphery barely reflect what is happening in the brain. And that's where the, the affective state are. Okay? So that's a challenge for us. So if we go a little bit further, and that's a slide from uh, the, Austri the um, Zoo and Aquarium Association of Australia, and they did this that I really like because you see here, this is positive welfare, but what they said is over a lifetime of animal, there is time where the welfare will be positive and there is time where the welfare will be negative. And when I said there will be negative welfare, I'm not saying cruelty. I'm saying that the animal might be challenged and might have difficulty to respond to the challenge. Okay? And they did that because in zoo it's well known that some animals who've got everything are bored to death. And we give them everything because we want them to be in positive welfare. We think that they are going to be in positive welfare all the time and they finish in negative welfare. And when I see that, I can't not think of animal production. And your slides on you know, this market flow just illustrate exactly my point. Sometimes you need to transport animal. And people say, you know, it's terrible for an animal. Yeah, it was terrible for an animal. Truck and transport truck have done a lot of progress, and there's still progress to be made. So basically what we do here, and what, what I've, I mean, this discussion of animal welfare have done to livestock is basically thinking, okay, we can measure very well those negative ones and try to actually get the bottom up and try not to actually inflict too much negative welfare to the animal. And now we are working on looking at getting positive. I will finish with one thing that a lot of people said, you know, uh, you always talk about temperament, experience, mental state of animal. Do you have any proof? And my answer is, no, I don't. Okay. I have no proof. But what I have from producer, a lot, he said, oh, yeah, you know, you know, when I put my sheep over there or my cattle over there or my pig over there, they're happy. I'm thinking, oh, that's funny. Happy? 
I think it's an emotion. I haven't, I haven't experienced it very, for a very long time because I've been working 33 years at this university. <laughs> but, but you see, and so there is something that is very powerful in the field of animal welfare is a quantitative behavior ass assessment, which is basically people who do not know anything about animals that look at animals and say, oh, those guys, those animals look really good and those animals look really bad. So there is a way for animals to communicate basically <coughs> what, what they feel. What I would like as a physiologist is to be able to measure something that would make me better. But animal, in my humble opinion, experience their, uh, their environment, experience what we do to them in a positive way or in a negative way. It's up to us to actually push it the right way. And I think the industry from the time I came here to now I've changed a lot of things. And there is actually more of the blue line than the, the red line. We still need to, to work on the red line, okay? That's basically what I wanted to say. I need to give you that. Brilliant. Thanks, Kelsey. Now, Dom and I didn't collude on this at all, but Dom's given a really nice introduction <laughs> for what I want to talk about. So Dom's introduced us all to the five freedoms. So my, what I'll tell you about today is basically thermal stress. It's pretty upfront to say that that's probably one of the major challenges that live export industry has had in Australia and globally even. And so we'll put that in the context of the five freedoms and then what the industry has done about it and what they're continuing to try and do about it. For thermoregulation, it's the second freedom that's relevant, freedom from discomfort. The problem we've got, as Don just alluded to, is how do we assess that? There's really only one species that we can assess thermal comfort. Even though you'll hear about thermal comfort zone in a lot of different species, it's really only humans that we can do it. In humans, Oh, sorry, this is, what I'm, this is going to be what I'll do for the next 10 minutes. So we'll talk a little bit about thermal comfort. This thing called the heat stress risk assessment model, or hot stuff, that the industry uses. I'll give you a brief about how that works, and then where the industry's at right now. So for us, it's fairly easy to assess thermal comfort. We use what's called a visual analog scale, and I'd give you these two boxes, and I'd ask you to put a tick. How do you, what's your thermal sensation right now from very cold to very hot, and what's your thermal comfort from very comfortable, uncomfortable down that end to very comfortable at that end. So I gave, if I gave that to most of you now, you'd probably put crosses about there and there. We measure the length from the left-hand axis to the cross, and we express that as a percentage of the full range. It's fairly easy to assess thermal comfort in humans, and that's how it's been done since basically thermoregulation evolved. We can't ask an animal, a non-human animal, to assess their th or to rate their thermal comfort. We can look at them. Maybe quantitative behavioural assessment that Dom just mentioned might get there. It's not there yet to try and assess thermal comfort. So what we need to do is measure something objectively. And as a scientist, I'd much prefer to measure something objectively. Now, every second year physiology student in the world gets a diagram like this. It basically shows animals' thermoregulation across a range of ambient temperature here on the x-axis, so from cold down here to hot up here. And there's a range of zones that we can define objectively for any species. Everybody knows about this thing called the thermoneutral zone. We'll talk about that in just a sec. But it's basically the range where an animal can thermoregulate just by adjusting blood flow to the skin. No active thermoregulation. So the animal's not sweating or panting, and it's not shivering or activating brown fat or any of the other things that animals do in the cold. But over the entire range, down here or outside of this, what's called the survival zone, an animal will die. But in between that, the animal can basically handle the thermal environment. 
as I said, everybody's heard of this one, the firma neutral zone. And that's the zone where you can thermoregulate simply, or an animal can thermoregulate simply by adjusting blood flow to the skin. Down here, very vasoconstricted. Up here, very vasodilated. So lots of blood going out to the skin. People often confuse the thermal neutral zone with the thermal comfort zone. As I said, it's only in humans you can measure the thermal comfort zone, and that does not align with the thermal neutral zone. Most of us become very uncomfortable at the upper end of the upper of the of the thermal neutral zone. And we're quite comfortable just below the firma neutral zone. And actually our productivity in factories, if you measure human productivity in factories, it's maximal just below the firma neutral zone. Outside of, and outside of the firma neutral zone, so we're measuring these physiological, uh, physiological indicators of thermoregulation, so body temperature, evaporative heat loss, and metabolic rate. Outside of the firma neutral zone, we've got what's called the prescriptive zone. That's the zone where an animal can still maintain the same body temperature, but it's doing it actively. So down here, the animal's shivering or activating, activating brown fat, and up here, the animal's sweating or panting, some kind of evaporative heat loss. So the animal still maintains body core temperature, but it's now outside of the thermoneutral zone. It's got to use some other physiological systems to achieve that thermoregulation. Then outside of the prescriptive zone, we've got the tolerance zone. Within the tolerance zone, body temperature rises in the heat or falls in the cold, so the animal becomes hypo or hyperthermic, but survival's not threatened, and most physiological systems still operate. So a slight change in body temperature has, as far as we know, very little effect on any other physiological system. Animals can still reproduce, for example, within the tolerance zone. Outside of the tolerance zone, then, is the survival zone, but above the tolerance zone and before you hit the survival zone, that's the zone where other physiological systems start to become impacted. So it's in here that animals probably stop thermoregulating, uh, sorry, stop reproducing. So the reproductive axis will switch off in very, very hot animals. And then of course in the extreme, we've got survival. So these terms that come from reptile physiology, but they've been inherited by the homeothermic uh, people, and it's fair to say that up until very recently, that was the limit that was used by the livestock industry. It's very objective. It's very easy to tell whether an animal's dead or alive. That's fairly easy to measure. But up until very recently, that was the measure that the livestock industry used to work out how is the industry doing. If you use that objective measure, you'd have to say that it's doing reasonably well. I can't find the late. I know there's a graph here that goes up to 2022, but I couldn't find it. But we've got goats, sheep, and cattle. And this is basically how many animals were unloaded at the other end as a proportion of how many were loaded at the start of the voyage. So you can see goats have improved tremendously up to almost zero deaths now for goats. Cattle, always done fairly well, but a fairly con continuous improvement. And sheep, we've seen the biggest improvements over the largest number of animals over the time that uh, this graph goes. People argue that one of the major impacts in here and the continual improvement here was this thing called the heat stress, stress risk assessment model. It was mandated, so exporters had to use this heat risk assessment tool. It was called hot stuff, or it is called hot stuff, it's still in use. And essentially what that risk assessment does is assesses the risk that a voyage will have greater than two, uh, a bigger than 2% risk of at least 5% mortality. Now on the graph I just showed you a second ago, you'll see that what was called a re or is called a reportable voyage is one where mortality exceeds 2%. So you might wonder, why did the industry go with a risk of 5%? Well, they wanted to identify heat stress as a mortality risk. And the problem is there's a lot of other reasons that animals die on boats, and, and disease is the big one, salmonellosis especially. So they wanted a model that was sent, not too sensitive, that a, a, a disease outbreak would basically mean that the model failed. So they decided that we want to go with a 2% risk of 5% mortality. I'll just show you briefly how the model works and then show you how it's come into practice. So essentially the model starts with a historical distribution of weather conditions for the voyage. So that's the voyage usually up across the equator and to a port. So there's a probability distribution for what's 
the ship likely to sail through on this voyage from small chance of very, very hot and small chance of very, very cold. The x-axis on there is called the wet bulb temperature, not the, and not the air temperature or the temperature as most of us know it that the weatherman tells us every night. That's basically the temperature of the air around us. And a merino sheep at 45 degrees in 10% humidity will laugh at you. It'll just pant away and it'll maintain an absolutely normal body temperature. But as you start cranking up the humidity and evaporative heat loss becomes less effective, that's when the animals get into trouble. And basically the wet bulb temperature is an attempt to incorporate the effect of temperature and humidity. And it works reasonably well for this purpose. Then that historical distribution is modified by the loading of the animals. So just as in here now, we're all adding about 100 watts each to the heat content of this room. So the animals standing on a deck contribute to the conditions on the deck. A sheep, a 60, 70 kilo sheep is making about 80 watts of heat about a little bit less than somebody like me is making. So it's hotter on the deck because there are animals there making heat, breathing out water vapour. So that distribution gets modified because of the animals on the deck. And that depends how many animals and the characteristics of the ship. Most importantly being the ventilation capacity of the ship. How often does it turn over the air on a deck? Then on the other side of the equation, is a distribution of probability of mortality. It's a beta distribution because there are always, when you measure uh, mortality in any species, including humans, there are those that are more likely to die down here on the skewed left tail, and then there's a median level, and then the high level. And again, this is wet bulb temperature on the x-axis. So there's some animals that'll succumb down here, and there's some animals that'll still be fine right up to the upper, upper uh, range of the distribution. Those two distributions are then merged together and essentially that red bit can quantify what's the chance that 5% of those animals are going to die. You can adjust it to anything they want, but the, the industry chose 5%. What's the chance that 5% of animals are going to die? And if that 2% uh, chance is exceeded in the heat stress, then the exporter had to do something about it or still has to do something about it. What can you do? There's really only one thing in all of that that's modifiable. Well, you could adjust the type of animal. So some sheep breeds are more heat sen uh, less heat sensitive than others. So you could change the animal type. That's fairly difficult to do. On the day, really the only thing an exporter can do is adjust the stocking density. So basically destock. So if there's a 2% chance that you'll see 5% mortality, you destock. Instead of taking 90,000 animals on a ship, you might only take 80,000 animals rerun the model, and if the risk is now less than 2%, the ship can go. That's the way it's worked, and it's still working much that same way now. And that was what was in the ASIL standards, the Australian standards for the export of livestock in 2018. That was where the industry was at in 2018. And then, of course, uh, uh, sorry, and a reportable voyage was one where mortality exceeded 2%. Then everything hit the fan in 2018 with the Awasi Express and the disaster that happened on board the Awasi Express uh, off Doha in, up in the Gulf. Mike McCarthy was commissioned by the federal government to do a report, an independent review of conditions for the export of sheep to the Middle East during the Northern Hemisphere summer, the so-called McCarthy Report. And what Mike concluded in that report is that we've got a shift from a mortality limit to a welfare limit. So the industry was basically dragged into the kind of stuff that Dom's been talking about, where it's no good just talking about the negative welfare. We can, well, we still are really only talking about negative welfare, I suppose, but we're gonna make things a little bit better. And he suggested that an objective way to assess welfare was a presence of what's called phase two panting. Now, just as we start to sweat when we get above our thermo neutral zone, sheep start to pant, Cattle start to pant and sweat. Sheep sweat a little bit, but not much. But panting's relatively easy to measure objectively. How often does an animal breathe in and out? You can just grab a Scott stopwatch and measure that yourself. But then what happens when an animal's body temperature starts to increase by a bit more than a degree Celsius? Sheep will get into what's called phase two panting. And in phase two panting, instead of becoming more, more, more rapid, it gets very, very labored and very, very heavy. 
So large tidal volume and lower frequency rather than rapid frequency and small tidal volume. That starts to have physiological challenges for animals because when you get into that rapid deep breathing or that more deep breathing, then alveolar ventilation, so lung ventilation increases and animals start to blow off carbon dioxide and that causes acid-base disturbances to the animals. So basically Mike said that's a fairly good welfare indicator for live export. That was followed by the Moss Review, and in, uh, a report from the Inspector General of Live Animal Exports, and then finally uh, a heat stress risk assessment technical reference panel that looked at all the reports and said, righto, what are we going to do out of all of this? And basically the, the technical review panel suggested that a wet bulb temperature of 28 degrees was when most animals would be engaged in phase two panning. And so 28 degrees wet bulb became the limit. After some public consultation, that was adjusted up to 29 degrees wet bulb. But basically the industry looked at it, some uh, work was commissioned on all the vessels, and it was concluded that most of the vessels in the fleet could not leave Australia with even 100 sheep on them and not exceed 29 degrees wet bulb on the deck. And so that's why uh, uh, when ASIL standards uh, 3.2 came out, this prohibition of export of sheep to the Middle East in the northern summer came in and basically what that means is that between 1st of June and 20, uh, 14th of September ships can't leave Australia because most of the ships in the fleet can't maintain wet bulb temperature below 29 degrees on the deck if the animals leave in the northern summer. So when it gets to the equator it's basically too hot. All of that got thrown into a little bit of uh, 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 contention when in 2020, so at the height of COVID, most of you probably remember the, the, uh, the, the Al Kuwait was docked in Perth. Uh, sheep were, I believe, being loaded or no, actually no. First, they all came down with COVID while they were still off the port. So the crew all came down with COVID. So then it was asked what's going to happen to the, and it was due to leave just before the 1st of June ban, but because the, the, the crew all had COVID, it was delayed. There were two court challenges and eventually the ship left Australia in mid to late June. So June 19, I think it was, the ship actually left uh, Fremantle. Happy to report that it went fairly well. The exporter was forced to destock, so not as many animals went on the ship because of that northern ban and the heat stress risk assessment. Basically, the, the exporter had to destock slightly, so there was more room for the animals, and importantly, less of a wet bulb rise on the deck from the animals that were present. But when the ship got to the other end, there'd been 28 sheep out of those 33,000 sheep died. That was the lowest mortality ever reported, and none of those animals died of heat stroke. They all died. Most of them died of injuries that they'd received in the feedlot while they were waiting to go on the boat. So that was a fairly good outcome and I think what that shows is that if the industry can get it right, doesn't always get it right, but can get it right and I think the heat stress risk assessment model has been really important and I should say I had nothing to do with it, I'm, so I'm not saying I did a great job, it was some other people that did it. But I think that it's given everything we've talked about here this afternoon, it's pretty clear that the industry has to start assessing animal welfare during voyages and there's been some progress made in that area. And of course, as Liz talked about, it's really unclear what's going to happen if the ALP wins the next federal election because they've basically one of their campaign promises prior to the last federal election was if they get back in at a second term, they'll do away with live export altogether. I think it's unclear whether that's sheep and cattle or just sheep, but that's a, a situation we need to keep uh, aware of. Thank you. Okay, I think there are, um, there are actually two questions there. So the first question is, why can't we have more abattoirs? And why can't we process the animals here? As a, and I, I'm, I'm filling in the end of your sentence, as opposed to in the Middle East? Yeah, okay, so the, the second part of the question is probably the easiest to answer. You can, uh, this, this is the best response I've ever heard to this question, which is very common, incidentally. Um, you can buy fresh milk and you can also buy UHT milk. 
Which milk do you buy? Why? Because it's better. Exactly, because it's better, there's something, it's fresh. It's the same thing for people in the Middle East. They want their, they want their meat fresh, just like we, we, we they, they can have frozen, they can have frozen meat. And we do ship frozen meat. We ship a lot of frozen meat. Um, but, and, it's, and it's a market that's doing very well at the moment, incidentally. Um, but, it's, but, it, but it's because it's a, it, it's a preference. Um, it's a preference that people um, in our um, partner markets prefer fresh meat. The second part, um, the first, actually the, the first part of the question is, why don't we build more abattoirs in this state? Building abattoirs um, is extremely expensive um, and it has become more expensive in the past um, with all the compliance associated with building infrastructure that is associated with the ending of animals' lives. Um, it's extremely expensive, so it's extremely capital intensive. Um, it is extremely difficult, nigh and impossible to get staff um, to work in abattoirs. Um, I went to uni so I don't have to work in an abattoir. Um, <laughs> um, and, I, yeah, and so it's extremely difficult to, um, other than have a really good time at uni, um, I went, so, so um, extremely, it's not impossible to get staff. In fact, where this country is really importing staff to work in abattoirs. And of course, um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but we, we've also got a housing crisis. Um, <laughs> so once we get them here, there's nowhere for them to live. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, and also the other, the other point um, that I make, sorry, uh, Kelsey, I will finish in a minute. Um, the other point um, that I'll make um, is that what we're seeing at the moment, um, with, with, well, with particularly with the structure of the sheep and cattle industry, is that it's extremely seasonal. So at the moment, there, is a, there are far too many sheep and cattle um, in Western Australia and it, the system is gridlocked. There is nowhere for them to go because all the processes are just too full and too busy to take any livestock. But that's not what the situation is all the time. And, and so would you invest that massive amount of money because there's, because there's less livestock here. There's, 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 a, 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 there's, less, there's less animals to put through and more seasonal variation in the sheep and cattle industry. If you're a, a pig or poultry industry where they are exceedingly well organised, <laughs> <laughs> they bind out the they bind out the, the the problems that we've got. They've still got problems of their own, but in the sheep and cattle industry, it's it's very 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 difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a perf. Yeah, absolutely, and cost. Um, and yeah, co cost um, of the availability of labour, and um, yeah, and and cost of compliance. Um, in the good old days, you could just knock up an abattoir and do whatever you want with it. Not anymore, for very good reasons. Yeah, and and um, particularly export compliance. Um, when you know, when you've got customers who are demanding, for example, halal um, accreditation, this is just more and more and more and more cost to an already very expensive industry. Marian, the communications expert. Uh, I wouldn't quite <laughs> say that. I, in all honesty, I don't know. Well. They haven't, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of people, the industry sort of at the moment is decreasing, people are mating a lot to crossbreds, you know, people are, aren't mating sheep at all, people are talking about going to total croppers and I think a lot of people within the industry are just going, like, unless your heart and soul is in sheep, unless you're a stud breeder, I think most people will just say get out of sheep. And in terms of winning the hearts and mind, I, I don't know what the industry is going to look like if live export gets banned. But the industry, like, we're, we're all still here to support and the industry will, it will look different but it will still, yeah, still be here in some regard. It's always a mix of both. It depends on how popular and how well the post does. So when the Bahasia happened and there was lots of people commenting and liking and engaging, we, it was on lots of people's For You pages and that was like a comment we received being like, this is on my For You page, like, what the hell? Like I don't, I don't support this industry, and people jump jump on just to comment that. It 
and but we do have people that like Anne Britton and a few other people that consistently sort of jump on and they're quite positive for us and you see that as well on um, Twitter and Facebook tend to be the more comment heavy. So there's definitely a few several people that are supporting the industry but you do tend to get a lot of really weird people jump on and comment some either horrible things or people just saying they expressing the, their dislike for the industry but you've got to remember you're not advocating for those that are fully against it you're advocating for those that sit in the middle and don't don't really know you're, you're educating those kind of people because you can sway them or you can educate them to understand the industry but someone that's an activist you're never going to convince to be for it I suppose I'll just add to that, like sometimes industry can be our worst critic. We did a post not too long ago about what you classify as mutton and it was about teeth and ageing sheep and that comment section ended up being filled with industry debating on what everyone defines and how they think that's different and it wasn't, that wasn't the intention. It was, Facebook tends to grab more of an industry sort of pre pre presence but sometimes the industry in trying to educate the general public can be our worst critic. It's not designed, our content isn't designed for them, but they can sometimes be the people jumping on and, and I suppose not making it look very good, yeah. Kelsey, can I just jump into something? Because um, something that I find fascinating about society is how um, society in general is changing its understanding and its relationship with animals. Um, as somebody who is extremely comfortable with my relationship and what I think about livestock and domestic animals, I consider I, I am perpetually shocked by how society is changing its mind on, for example, how it treats pets. And so, for example, apparently, you know, apparently we've got a cost of living crisis. But before, before Christmas, there were three or four aisles at Kmart dedicated to Santa costumes for cats and dogs. I find this really concerning. You know, talking about thermal, thermal temperature, people who take their border collies out in the rain wearing a coat. You know, and, and, and how people, uh, you know, there are very fancy names for this um, that I can't, pronounce off the top of my head but this is I think a real challenge you know in terms of what is natural and healthy about a livestock production system is becoming increasingly difficult to sell um, under the guise of our first world perceptions of what high welfare or good welfare is with pets. Um, I think that is something that that is that is one of the number one things that is that is making our lives very difficult. Do you know the organisation PIFA? You're probably on the board of it, sorry. <laughs> but that does, that does an enormous amount of um, work in helping communicate responsible messages um, about farming and food production um, at schools. It's a, it's a very impressive organisation if you're on the board. 